All right, I'm super excited to be talking with my friend, Dr. Tyler Austin. Uh, Tyler Austin is the Director of Bands and Assistant Professor of Music at Old Dominion University. Uh, Tyler, thank you so much for doing this with us. Absolutely, glad to be here. And really excited to talk a little bit about bassoon. Do you mind, for anybody who maybe doesn't know you, would you mind just sharing a little bit of your um, your background and uh, sort of what got you to Old Dominion? Absolutely. I have a uh, undergrad degree in music education from Susquehanna University, a master's in bassoon performance from the University of North Texas, and a doctorate in wind conducting from Michigan State University. After Michigan State, I went to Oklahoma State and was first assistant director of bands and then interim associate director of bands and director of cowboy marching band. And this was my first year at Old Dominion University where I conduct the wind ensemble, teach conducting and have graduate conducting students. That is fantastic. And we're, we're really excited to uh, have your expertise on this, uh, on the bassoon of all things, because um, I know from my own uh, methods courses that that was one that I walked out of a great methods course experience with lots of questions. And so um, I'm sure for anybody here who just is looking to, to brush up on their bassoon knowledge or uh, or maybe doesn't have as strong of a background, uh, might be able to get some information from you. Would you, and we're obviously talking about tone here, would you mind uh, just talking to us about how we might describe a characteristic tone or even possibly an uncharacteristic tone on bassoon, the sound that we're going for with our, our students? I think I always use the word nutty for a good bassoon sound. It needs to have that sort of woody quality, but not buzzy. Um, it needs to be deep without being muffled, um, very sonorous. And it, we think a lot of bassoon tone in terms of resonance because we're never going to be the loudest instrument making music. But so we just think about how big the sound is. And I think that that's really useful imagery um, when you're talking to a student, if you can say, can you take your sound from this to this? and what do you need to do with the air and the, the physical apparatus to get that to happen. But I think bigger rather than louder is always the key to success. Absolutely, very cool. What are uh, some of the necessary steps that are going to give a student the, all the things that they need to make that characteristic tone? And that goes from things like posture and embouchure. Um, obviously, I'm sure you're gonna talk a little bit about mouthpiece uh, and read and how that's going to when go into the picture, but do you mind just talking about the necessary steps to get that tone? Definitely. Bassoon posture is different from a lot of other instruments in that we encourage bassoonists to sit at the back of the chair. And that is for the reason that in America, we use the seat strap for bassoonists and the seat strap should be at the very front of the chair. Um, and you actually uh, want the strap under closer to the knees than to the back of the student, uh, because that puts the instrument actually parallel to their body. And if they're sitting at the front of the chair with their back away from the chair, then they aren't actually able to get a good angle. And they'll end up with something where the bassoon is kind of forward and they might have to crane a little bit. But if you really get the seat strap at the front, then it should get in a position where the reed can go straight into the mouth and the student can just sit completely normally and it's almost like the bassoon is floating. Um, and I would, I guess the only other thing with posture is that I, a lot of bassoon is about relaxation. I always use the analogy of playing a double reed instrument is like playing a bagpipe, except you're the bag. And so you don't want them to be like overly tall or you don't want them to, you know, be in any sort of unnatural position because they just need to be really, really relaxed in all of their posture to make the most kind of ease of sound as possible. Um, I would also say in terms of the embouchure, I'm pretty much going straight into the instrument or the, the instrument is going straight into my mouth. Um, some people play at a slight upward angle. Um, particularly there are people in uh, the Chicago school of playing that kind of play with this upward angle and they will teach young students to do that too. And it's just a articulation preference and style. Um, but I really prefer straight on 
and articulating on the bottom blade of the reed. Uh, not straight at the blade, but on the bottom blade primarily. Um, when it comes to embouchure, um, I start with just the reed and I tell my students it's a very easy embouchure and it's a fairly low pressure embouchure, though you don't want a lot of leaking um, and air escaping because that's very easy to do. Um, but I tell them to say, ooh, and then while they're saying ooh, I tell them to say ah. So I have them go ooh, ooh. And then that basically just creates the roundness that we want in the embouchure and drops the jaw and creates a lot of space. My bassoon teacher at UNT always said, you want to feel like you have a cathedral in your mouth, the most resonating potential as possible. And so that's kind of the easiest uh, way to get a student into that sort of space. But there used to be a lot of method books that would say, have a really wide embouchure or almost like a smile embouchure and pull the chin really far back. And you ended up with this like very um, held sort of embouchure. And that's not the pedagogy anymore, though you will still find it in some method books. But almost everyone is going for just round, relax, drop the jaw. Very, very cool. Could you talk to us a little bit about read, um, reads, particularly like for um, and this, everything from a beginning student who is in their first year, they just opened, learned how to open the bassoon case, all the way through perhaps a uh, player that's in, in high school. I absolutely believe that regardless of the level of the student, they need to have good reads, if not professional quality reads. And there's actually not a huge price disparity between something that's mass produced in a music store and a handmade read. Um, so the best thing to do is to reach out to a bassoonist in your local symphony and ask them if they make reads or if they know someone that makes reads or maybe someone makes reads for them. Not all bassoonists make their own reads. Um, and really you just want to make sure that the construction is really good and that someone has really taken care because you said before the mouthpiece and i do think of the reed as the mouthpiece and so it's just the same as a 20 dollar clarinet mouthpiece versus a 200 dollar clarinet mouthpiece you're going to get the same benefits but in this case it's not necessarily money it's more time that the person is putting into the reed and, and craftsmanship and so, you know, while a store-bought read you might be able to buy for $12 to $14, um, with a handmade read you might spend $20, but you're getting something that's five times better. So it's for, for that couple of dollars, I really think that it's worth it. And then it's a big preference thing. I use reads that are in what's called the Hertzberg School. Um, and that's just one of very many schools of reeds. There are Garfield reeds, they're kind of like big oboe reeds. Um, my reeds are more scraped like two clarinet or saxophone reeds that are put together in terms of how we outline the design of the reed. They're simple reeds basically. Um, I would say that Hertzberg reeds or anything that's made on a fox shaper, um, if, if you see those two words, then you're generally pretty safe for a student. I wouldn't want to get into something really specialized. Um, so Hertzberg and fox shaper uh, combination would be a very safe bet if you're going to try some uh, handmade reads that you're buying off of a website like Midwest Musical Imports sells very high quality professional level bassoon reads for an affordable price. Very, very cool. And for uh, those of us in here uh, who are listening to this that maybe also are are loosely aware, but maybe not fully aware of all the things that make double reed instruments when it comes to reed maintenance and preparing the reed before you play and, and taking care of the reed afterwards, could you just talk a little bit about um, just some of the weeks sh that we should be expecting of our students from day one of how to take care of that awesome reed that they've just purchased? Absolutely. And I should 
put a big disclaimer that there are like a million and seven ways to skin the cat. Yeah. And so I'm <laughs> going to give opinions and they are only my opinions, but um, I just use a medicine bottle uh, to soak my reeds. They're perfect for students because they're really durable and you can even put it in the case with the cap on and it's not going to leak as long as you get a good one. Um, and you can buy them for like 50 for ten dollars on amazon um so i just put the entire reed in the water and have it submerged um and it's important to not only have the blades of the reed submerged but actually the entire tube because that's part of the resonating apparatus for the reed um and i'll leave it there for a minute maybe two um really all you have to do is just um just kind of dunk it in fully. And as long as it's covered in water, then the water is gonna go into the reed. I personally don't see a big difference between oversaturating and like, you can't really leave it in the water for too long. I have accidentally left a reed in the water for a while and then I'm just really careful about drying it out. And it, it usually is fine. I wouldn't recommend that. Maybe like a maximum of five minutes um, but you really can't do too much damage to them by leaving them in the water. Um, and then I would just say like, leave some of the water on it. Like I said, there's just kind of like a little layer of liquid on the reed right now as I'm holding it. And so that's just going to kind of soak in, um, and give you something that has mobility, like the ability, uh, uh, the ability to vibrate, but isn't necessarily going to be weighed down by extra water. And then I would just say, when you put the reed away after you have played on it, I always take my two fingers and just kind of wipe it off and get some of the gunk off of it um, and blow it out from the back and then wipe it off again and put it in the case and make sure you have a aerated case. I use a, a wooden case that has holes in the sides of it. Uh, so it just, it's pretty self-explanatory um, in terms of just taking it out and putting it away. Adjusting it is very complicated. Yeah, <laughs> of course, yes, um, of course. And then, and for, for, I think for a lot of our purposes, when you say adjusting it, what do you mean by adjusting it? So you can actually tweak the reed uh, just like you would use a different reed and ligature on a single reed mouthpiece. You can make adjustments to the reed. So let's see if I can demonstrate close to the camera. Um, the reed has three wires. Uh, the third wire on my reed is covered up by glue. Um, but the first and second wires are where you do most adjustments. and. I always say the first wire behaves like it's supposed to, and the second wire is contrary, and it does not <laughs> behave like it's supposed to. So for example, for the first wire, if you squeeze the top and bottom of the first wire, it will close the tip of the reed, which just looks like it makes sense. And if you squeeze the sides of the first wire, it will open the reed. All of that makes perfect sense. Unfortunately for the second wire, it's backwards. So if you squeeze the top and bottom of the second wire, it will actually open the reed. Um, and vice versa, the sides uh, would actually close the reed. So it's uh, just whatever the first wire does, the second wire does the opposite thing. And then the first wire is for kind of more macro adjustments, like a little goes a really long way with the first wire. And then the second wire is more for fine tuning. This is a gross oversimplification, but uh, that's kind of how I would treat it as a band director. So here are some easy troubleshoots. If your bassoonist is always playing flat, then the reed might be a little bit too resistant. And so I would squeeze the top and bottom of the first wire to close the tip of the reed, make it less resistant, and then hopefully that would help to bring the pitch up for the student. Um, if a student is having trouble articulating, 
um, and it seems like their articulation is really thuddy. Same thing, the read may be really open and resistant to the student's articulation. So I would take that first wire, squeeze the top and the bottom. You can even use your fingers um, and you can apply a fair amount of pressure and you're not gonna damage the read. Um, and that's probably gonna give them a little bit more ease of articulation. Um, on the other hand, if they sound really thin or they're having a lot of problems creating volume on the instrument um, or breadth of sound, then the tip might be too closed. And so I would squeeze the sides of the first wire and open the tip to allow them to get a little bit more resistance going so that they have more to push against on the instrument. Um, and I'll leave it at that, but there are a bunch of tricks, and honestly, the best thing that you can do is just talk to a professional bassoonist. They might tell you that everything that I just said is completely opposite of what they believe. It's very, very, very individual, and it's honestly, in my opinion, a little bit of pseudoscience and just things that we do for ourselves to make ourselves be able to go to sleep at night. But uh, I think that those are a couple easy band director hacks for sure. That's good, and that, and the whole idea of this is, of course, to make sure we have uh, just some things that we could even even if they're just stuff for us to be able to to to, to try um, as we're getting more comfortable with the instruments, and uh, and then start to uh, expand upon the stuff that we talk about today. I think that's the whole name of the game. So I think that's that's fantastic, and uh, and with those troubleshoots, you know, we obviously the main topic of what we're talking about is is tone today. Um, and so I'm curious to know what you find are like some of the most common bad habits, performance errors that you see on bassoon. Uh, what are, might be the signs of them in our sound? And what are some of the, the quickest ways you think to, uh, to take care of those? I think posture is the biggest thing because people assume because it's called a seat strap and people also colloquially call it a butt strap that it's supposed to you know be under the student's butt, and it's just not. It's supposed to be actually as far away um, from your torso as possible. And so you end up a lot of the time with students that are really like scrunched up because they have the instrument so close to them that they can't like, they just can't relax and get to the point where they're able to make a good sound. Um, so that's like number one for me, the first thing that I do is make sure that my students are sitting correctly because I know that it's gonna solve so many problems down the line. Uh, the second thing that I think is really, really important is stressing to them that it is a relaxed embouchure because it's very easy to get sort of clamped and then you're closing the reed, you're gonna have trouble getting volume, you're gonna have trouble articulating. Um, and so just kind of that even pressure, very much like the saxophone, actually, like the saxophone embouchure should have kind of equal pressure and use the analogy of like a drawstring purse where everything kind of comes in um, equally. It's very much the same thing with the bassoon, just making sure that there's an equal cushion around the entire reed uh, on all sides. Um, those are probably the two big things for me. Um, and then of course, like, Hand position is a big thing. Um, in bassoon, we actually use more flat fingers. So as opposed to like curved fingers for saxophone or clarinet, just because of the reach of the instrument, we it's not that my fingers aren't curved at all, but it's just that we don't try to avoid flat fingers because you know most students when they start the instrument, even if they're in eighth or ninth grade, are still growing and you just don't want to make them feel bad about, you know, ha being able to reach the keys. Um, and, and I just think that for the technique of the instrument also with the curved fingers going onto holes that do not have any sort of key, um, if you just kind of have a more static finger that's not like you know, going straight in and out, but more it's like a lever that's closing, then I think that that gives a little bit more accuracy for the students. Gotcha. Do you ever find that there's any issues with tension in the fingers with young students? I do. Okay, and so so is that just something that is to be aware of and just constantly remind them, like, let's keep our fingers nice and relaxed? And Exactly, yeah. I, I think the, the thing that I see the most, 
I have a hard time doing it actually, but there are a lot of students that have kind of like double jointed sort of look where their oh, finger yeah. ends up going the wrong way. And so we don't want that for sure. Uh, we want flat and relaxed rather than that hyper engaged sort of look. Absolutely, very, very cool. And so what are some other things that just, even and this could be um, exercises, this could be something that's part of a daily warm up or something. What, what do you find are the best ways to, to reinforce and check in and, and maintain this, this tone in a, a young musician, both again, a, a beginning musician, but also maybe a student that's been playing for a couple of years? So if you play the reed with a very engaged embouchure, you're gonna get one pitch that's very high. And then you can flex that pitch. But if you play the reed with a really relaxed embouchure, which is the embouchure you should be playing on the instrument, then you'll get what's called a crow, which is multiple pitches at once. And the more pitches you have in the crow, in my opinion, the more you're setting yourself up to have a really resonant, full-bodied sound on the instrument. And so just having your beginning students like first play one pitch and then play relax and think about the embouchure and play the crow and they can kind of experiment and find that sweet spot of where they're getting the most pitches um in the crow of the reed and then that's going to be what's uh will create the best sound on the instrument for them um and then really it's just about balancing that relaxation with the fact that the airstream of the bassoon is very fast and focused. Um, I use the analogy when I play with my students that it's like you have a pin in the vocal and you're shooting the pin straight through the instrument as fast as you can because they'll tend to think that it the air would go that way which looks a little bit more uh, not fast <laughs> or at least indirect yeah. um, and you really need to like pop a balloon across the room with your airspeed um, so relaxed embouchure but fast and focused airstream is going to produce probably the most resonant result all right dr austin this has been really really fantastic um if anybody has any additional questions or follow-up questions about what you've talked about today uh, do you mind if they reach out to you at your email at old dominion Yes, it is tgaustin at odu.edu. Fantastic. And we'll actually include that along with uh, Dr. Austin's bio down in, the, uh, down in the video description here. And I'll also link to that as well as some of the other things that he's talked about. Dr. Austin, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.